I'm pleased to introduce Christy Hamilton. Christy is a science journalist and award-winning author. She's written for Wired, Science Magazine, Business Insider, among many other publications. Her hobbies include climbing, photography, pursuing local bookstore, perusing local bookstores <laughs> in each town she visits. She has degrees in journalism and neuroscience, and today she's here to talk about her book, Nature's Wild Ideas, How the Natural World is Inspiring Scientific Innovation. Please join me in giving her a warm welcome. Thank you. <laughs> As Dave said, uh, my name is Christy Hamilton, and I'm the author of Nature's Wild Ideas, a book about the plants and animals that have inspired some of our great inventions. For this presentation, I'll take you on a journey of a few examples from the book. And my aim is to provide you with a glimpse of the strategies these creatures use to survive, because the ingenuity of their designs are truly remarkable. For example, which creature in the Sonoran Desert inspired a type 2 diabetes medication? Or which animal under the sea inspired a more sustainable cement? And what about a plant that inspired a new kind of lithium-ion battery? Over two years, I interviewed more than 50 scientists to answer questions like these. While researching these stories, um, many of these inventions were known or largely unknown. So many of us may have heard of Velcro, but I also discovered some of these life-saving medications or a Nobel Prize winning invention that were lesser known to the public. So I started compiling a spreadsheet and I ended up with this massive list that I narrowed down to 13 chapters that I felt were compelling, impactful, and also lesser known to the general public. So as you may know, this idea of drawing inspiration from nature for scientific innovation has a fancier name. Biomimicry is the study of nature for inspiration to solve human design challenges. This discipline has scientists asking, what in the natural world has already figured out the answer to what I'm trying to solve? The term biomimicry was first coined by Otto Schmidt in the 1950s and was popularized by Janine Benyus in the 1990s. Janine was the one to kind of ask, why do we all sit at a table with a blank piece of paper and take inspiration from other human designers when there exists an abundance of innovation out in nature? Nature is often incredibly efficient and uses few materials. I personally see biomimicry as a space that allows us to ask how we can design more gracefully and efficiently. Of course, I should mention that biomimicry is not a cure for all that ails us. It is simply a source of inspiration for ideas that we may have never thought of ourselves. In writing this book, my hope is to explore the detective work that has occupied thousands of scientists around the world, universities like Harvard University, Georgia Tech, and Imperial College London are at the forefront of bio-inspired research. For example, where we humans use chemicals to paint colors, life sometimes uses shape. While the paints we use to color our cars emit toxic fumes, Many bird feathers and butterflies use a technique called structural color to reflect and refract light at the nano level in such a way that we see color. So surprisingly, peacock feathers only use brown pigments. The rest of the color that you see, those greens and blues, are structural color. So we have researchers asking, what if we could build colors right into the structure of a product? we could potentially reduce the number of toxic chemicals we use. Of course, it's important to clarify from the outset that evolution does not have foresight or some divine plan in mind. It is a series of adjustments to adapt to local changes in the environment. As such, evolution does not have an inventive mind like engineers, and animals have constraints such as the need to eat, reproduce, and defecate, which thankfully our products can go without. 
However, biological designs can provide fresh solutions to old paradigms. Lastly, this talk aims to foster a sense of wonder towards the natural world. Often we judge animals by comparing their actions to our own, but this limits our understanding of them. The truth can be much more profound. So take a fun example, a simple cow. These cows appear to be gazing into the distance, idle and unintelligent. In reality, cows don't need to look around. They possess a panoramic view of their surroundings. So their seemingly dull look is not a reflection of their intelligence, so much a consequence of having eyes on the sides of their heads. Humans, of course, have forward-facing eyes, and so we look around a lot more, which perhaps looks a bit more like curiosity. And since the purpose of this book is to look at the world with fresh eyes, I'm going to start by taking you back in time to 350 years ago in the Netherlands, where a fabric merchant named Anton van Leeuwenhoek lived. Anton was a largely self-taught man who was not satisfied with the magnifying glasses at the time. So he began to make his own by heating, grinding, and polishing thin filaments of glass into super tiny spheres. And he ended up making a magnifying glass that was 10 times better than anything else at the time. The device was only as big as a paper clip, and the glass sphere was only three millimeters in diameter. So looking through the microscope was probably as comfortable as trying to watch a movie on a screen smaller than a grain of rice. And yet, he would also go on to revolutionize the world. Anton turned his microscope on everything and anything he could get his hands on. The pond water from his own backyard, the white stuff scraped off his own teeth, red blood cells, and he even turned his microscope on his own marital bed. Now, as you can imagine, this caused quite an uproar, but maybe not for the reasons you think. No one knew at the time what was in semen. They thought that maybe vapor was released from semen and that somehow stimulated women to make babies, while other theories thought that the men actually made the babies and then just transferred them to the females for incubation. I think the men probably overestimated their contribution on that one. Um, but it wouldn't even be, it'd be 200 years before scientists actually agreed on how babies were made. But Anton also saw something else. He saw what he called animacules, or small living animals that move themselves very extravagantly. We now know of these animacules as bacteria. With his microscope, Anton opened the gates to a hidden world that contained a staggering number of species waiting to be discovered. In the process, he was excited to learn that his very own body was host to many other organisms, too. His world was completely flipped upside down. And this is what I love about science. With enough ingenuity, we can ignite this spark of awe again and again and again, even in the plants and animals we thought we understood. For example, take a look at all this variety of glue in the animal and plant kingdoms. Glue has been an important evolutionary tool, one that has been reiterated upon many times and in all types of environments. For example, there is the sea cucumber that shoots a stringy white substance from its back end to tangle an adversary. Snails, of course, use a slimy foot to slide up walls. The sundew plant uh, ensnares prey in their sticky drops. And the Cape rain frog in South Africa is so round and their feet are, and their legs are so short that they can't actually hold on to each other when they mate. So they have to ooze this gluey stuff from their skin to help each other hold on. And another marvel is one you can order in most coastal seafood restaurants. Blue mussels are the focus of chapter six in my book, and at first glance, they may seem kind of boring, but blue mussels are amazing in that their glue needs the fortitude to withstand the smashing of waves and baking hot dry spells all in a day's time. 
They also need to resist hungry seagulls pecking at their shells and the effect of being sandblasted by debris. You wouldn't think this is a good environment for glue, especially considering we can barely get the glue in our own bandages to stay sticky in the shower. Most of our glues look more like this. Packaging, envelopes, cell phones, books. Glue in dry environments. A challenge, then, for scientists is to develop an adhesive that can stay sticky in the presence of salts, water, and other contaminants. Imagine being able to seal the delicate sac in which a baby grows, or picture glues being used instead of stitches. We already use surgical glues, but only for the external surface of the skin. We don't use glues inside the body. Not only that, but there are instances where glues outshine sutures. Sutures and staples pose a higher risk of patient discomfort and infection than sealants, and they do this because they create a small damage to the surrounding tissue. You can even see the inflammatory response in this photo here. Also, a fair number of people, like my mother, are allergic to the current glues used in adhesive bandages. Perhaps by understanding how muscle glue works, we can revolutionize its application and even potentially save lives. One more pretty big issue with our glues is to create a safe, biodegradable glue without the potential risks that come from formaldehyde glues. Formaldehyde is a strong-smelling chemical that is used as a gas at room temperature. It is used as a preservative in mortuaries and as glue for pressed wood products such as furniture. It is a useful substance, but it's also considered a human carcinogen since the vapor released in the production process raises cancer and toxicity concerns. For firefighters, this is a very real risk. The incidence of cancers in firefighters are several times higher than in the general populace, suggesting exposure to carcinogens as part of firefighting could have harmful side effects. And one of those potential carcinogens is formaldehyde. Lastly, formaldehyde glues are created using fossil fuels. So while there's no immediate shortage of petroleum resources, they are naturally limited. The need to address these challenges are not only crucial for human health and environmental sustainability, but also for the long-term viability of the adhesive industry. So something new and better was needed. In 1999, Professor Lee from Oregon State University was scouring the coast for blue mussels with his friends. While they were out there collecting as many mussels as possible, Professor Lee was nerding out and bagging some for future research. He was amazed by how hard it is to remove the mussels from the rock. He even needed a small crowbar to pry them away. So why was it so difficult? Well, you may have seen these threads before. Um, chefs call them beards and de-beard them before cooking. Uh, scientists call these Bissell threads. Bissell threads can stretch to 160% of their original length and are five times stronger than our own Achilles tendon. If you spot a mussel making one of these threads, you'll see a brown foot slither out from its shell. I know it looks like some kind of weird tongue, but it's actually a long, skinny foot. And once its foot hits a surface like a rock, the muscle creates stringy fibers that tether them to the surface like tent lines. I kind of see these muscles as like the Superman, as like the Spider-Mans, excuse me, of the tide pools, because they make dozens of these tent lines, each with a tiny spot of glue at the end, just a couple millimeters across. And that tiny spot of glue is what makes it so hard for people to pry them from the rock. So let's zoom in closer to see how they do this. The muscle's foot is actually hollow. This hollow chamber is airtight and watertight and acts like a plunger to draw liquid proteins down the hollow tube in its foot. The muscle's foot then pumps and massages those chemicals into a foam-like substance to create a, a thread. To then create that spot of glue, the most important ingredient is a chemical called L-DOPA. And as soon as I say that, you may think of its use in Parkinson's, but it's actually being used in a completely different fashion here. For the whole muscle, 
the process takes, for the, for the muscle to create this uh, thread, the whole process takes only five minutes. I personally find this fascinating in its own right, but Lee's journey didn't end there. Harvesting muscle proteins just simply isn't feasible from a cost perspective. It would take 10,000 muscles to create a quarter of a teaspoon of glue proteins. And since we can't extract glue from muscles like we can milk from cows, Professor Lee needed to invent a synthetic version that mimics the muscle's grip. So he had one more step to complete. He added soy, which was actually common as a glue between the 1930s and 1960s until formaldehyde took over. Soy was used as a glue because it's inexpensive and abundant, unlike muscle glue, but it isn't strong or resistant to water. So by mixing together the best of soy and the best of muscle proteins, Professor Lee was able to create a soy glue imbued with a Frankenstein mix of muscle strength. A company called Purebond purchased his glue for their manufacturing and ended up replacing 47 million pounds of formaldehyde resins while reducing hazardous air pollutants by 50 to 90%. In the process, he created a cost-competitive glue that others wanted to use. Of course, this doesn't mean that the glue is net zero. It's simply a step towards a less toxic, renewable option. Perhaps if we want to do even better, we will need to look to other inspirations. Maybe one like this little creature. This is a caddisfly larva, which scientists are only just starting to study. In an interesting twist, these larvae glue pebbles completely submerged underwater in rivers, and they do this using their sticky spit. Underneath those rocks that you see is actually a very soft body that kind of looks like a chubby white maggot. It's certainly an inventive solution, and perhaps there's some scientific trick waiting to be discovered there. Okay, so we've covered muscles and their use as an inspiration for a new kind of glue, so let's go back to see another sea cuisine commonly served up at restaurants. In chapter two of the book, I discuss lobsters, which are quirky creatures in their own right. They don't have a central brain in their heads like us. They actually have neurons spread throughout their body, which makes them more similar to insects in that regard. They also have another peculiarity where they urinate from nozzles in their face to attract mates. Um, but what else have we learned from them except that they taste really good? Well, it's actually those beady black eyes of theirs that are astonishing. A lobster's eye is 256 times more powerful at seeing in the dark than a human eye is in daylight. In fact, most creatures on Earth don't have an eye design like lobsters. So when an astronomer read the work of a crustaceans biologist, I'll give you a sneak peek at what was created. An X-ray telescope on board a satellite sailing through space. Okay, obviously we need to take a step back and see how we got here. For years, the bigger a telescope's mirror, the better. It was a pretty obvious one-to-one -one ratio. The bigger the mirror, the better its ability to catch light. However, a 12-foot mirror needs a cathedral-sized dome to focus the light of distant stars. Not only that, but heavy mirrors store more heat, which distorts the image. What astronomers needed was a lightweight and yet still stiff mirror um, that they could use. Astronomer and professor James Roger Pryor Angel decided to look to nature to come up with the next step in innovation. He made honeycomb mirrors. The honeycomb design reduces the weight of a telescope mirror by about 80%. This individual mirror arrangement fits together and also makes a roughly circular shape, which is desired to focus light onto a small region of the telescope's detectors. Honeycomb mirrors also have a ribbed structure behind them to support the mirror's face for high stiffness. But still, for decades, we were only able to capture visible infrared and UV light. So what about X-rays? X-rays are shot out of exploding stars, black holes, 
galaxy clusters, and other high energy events. And we care about these because when stars die, their metallic shrapnel explodes into the universe, and those elements go on to become the next generation of stars, planets, and perhaps billions of years later, life on a planet. However, it's tricky to detect X-rays because their intense energy zooms through everyday objects, hence their use in medical devices and airport scanners. In fact, X-rays are so powerful, they beam right through typical optical telescopes, much as a bullet slams into a wall. So for many years, astronomers were at a loss how to capture them. Again, it was Professor Angel who came up with the idea of a nature-inspired telescope, this time inspired by the lobster eye. If you look at a lobster eye under a microscope, it actually looks like perfect graph paper. That eye is composed of thousands of tiny mirrored tubes that are 20 times smaller than the period at the end of a sentence. The lobsters are not really using mirrors as we know them, but they're using another form of ref reflective surface, sort of like you see in the scales of a fish or the shiny plumage of birds. These mirrors are a great way to catch x-rays by grazing them off the mirror's surface and capturing them at a shallow angle. Um, this makes the rays less energetic. Returning to the bullet example, this would be kind of like bullets ricocheting off a wall when they hit at a grazing angle. But despite these mirrors, mirrored eyes being so powerful, they have not been a popular choice in evolution, and this is because they have a serious weakness. Although they're compact and they gather lots of light, they produce a low-quality image. What they get in return is a 180-degree view, view of the world. And with our previous X-ray telescopes that we'd made, we could only see half a degree view of the sky. To put that in perspective, that is like seeing the size of the moon as seen from Earth. This means that astronomers had to point their telescopes at just the right spot and at just the right time in the sky to capture an X-ray event. It's not exactly practical or cost-effective. Professor Angel hypothesized that a lobster-based instrument, with its hundreds to thousands of reflective tubes pointing in all directions, could capture X-rays from a much larger portion of the sky. In fact, where our older version, known as the Chandra X-ray Observatory, has a field of view roughly the size of the moon as seen from Earth, our latest lobster eye telescope has a field of view the size of 1,000 moons. So let's see some of the use cases of lobster-inspired telescopes. In 2018, the Mercury Imaging X-ray Spectrometer was launched on board a joint European and Japanese mission called BepiColombo. This is the first ever X-ray telescope to be sent to another planet. The mission will take about seven years to reach Mercury, which is the smallest planet in our solar system at about the size of the continental United States, and it's also a planet of extremes. The telescope is designed to map Mercury's elemental composition and the interaction of Mercury's surface with the surrounding space environment. Another, called the X-ray Imaging Telescope, will be launched aboard the Space Variable Objects Monitor. This space observatory will spot the afterglows of gamma-ray events, which are even more powerful than X-rays. Gamma-ray events emit more energy than the Sun ever will during its 10 billion year life. The, be the best way to spot these events is actually to observe their X-ray afterglows. However, these events happen so quickly, we need to capture them using a telescope with a large field of view. This telescope is also incredible in that it's super light at just 77 pounds. And the newest addition is the Chinese lobster eye imager for astronomy. The imager was launched in near-Earth circular orbit and will be pointed at the Scorpius binary star system and the Cygnus Loop Nebula. The team are using this telescope as prep for their ultimate X-ray telescope on board the Einstein probe next year, which is the one that will have a field of view equivalent to 1,000 moons as seen from Earth. As you can see, lobsters are literally providing us with an entirely new way of seeing the universe. 
in the animal kingdom is ripe with other biological sensors too. There is the electroreception of a platypus. Roundworms can detect magnetic fields of Earth. There is the polarized vision of an octopus, the fire detection of jewel beetles, and the magnetic sensors of bees. Pit vipers detect infrared light with night vision sensitive enough to notice when temperatures vary by a thousandth of a degree. And even the tiny dung beetle have evolved to use light from the Milky Way for navigation. Now, despite the ingenuity of these animals, I should mention that nature and human innovations differ in significant ways too. For example, humans use rotary motion for all sorts of things from propellers to wheels, whereas nature prefers legs, wings, and fins. And you may ask, like, why has the wheel not found its place in nature's toolkit? There are actually several evolutionary reasons for why the development of a wheel is challenging. For one, wheels only work well on flat roads, not in the field where there's potholes like where zebra roam. But another one is also that engineers can introduce sudden changes into their designs. Nature, on the other hand, works through gradual adaptations over time. This means that the intermediate structure to get to something like a wheel needs to provide a benefit or at least not be detrimental to the creature, which is pretty challenging. So while the diversity of strategies life has used to survive certainly haven't enabled all species to thrive, life still exists on this planet after millions of years and multiple catastrophes. The inventions mentioned in this book are by no means perfect in the whole sense of the word, but they do inspire the imagination towards something more symbiotic with the world around us. A greater theme I weave into this book is that preserving diversity benefits all creatures on this planet, us included. The deeper we explore Earth's library, the more we learn. And yet, modern extinction rates are estimated to be 100 to 1,000 times greater than the natural baseline rate. What if instead of viewing ourselves as nature's conquerors, we see ourselves as guardians of this library? Unfortunately, humanity's connection to nature is only diminishing with time. As hunter-gatherers, we spend a huge portion of our time outdoors. As life becomes more urban, people are spending more and more time indoors. In fact, kids only spend one hour on average outdoors per day in the UK. By some estimates, children in the UK aged between 5 and 15 spent two hours a day watching television and four hours looking at screens. Is there a way we can reach a greater balance between spending time in nature, conserving these wild spaces, and progressing as a society? Progress does not inherently have to mean at the cost of. Perhaps we can innovate something better. We have millions of species on Earth who we can take inspiration from. So, to return to the biomimicry examples I presented at the beginning, I'll reveal the what that inspired them. So, a type 2 diabetes medication was inspired by the Gila monster that lives in the Sonoran Desert. Cement bricks that take much less CO2 than conventional cement to create were inspired by hard coral. And a new kind of lithium ion battery was inspired by pomegranates. These examples are just a few mentioned in the book, but there are many others. In all, I hope you come away with a deeper appreciation for the natural world, a world brimming with inspiring designs. Thank you to Google for, for the invitation, and thank you all for still reading books and supporting authors so that we can continue to, t to share these kinds of stories. Thank you. So if you have questions, feel free to get up to the mics and we'll get to you in just a little bit. But how did you go about um, researching this book? Yeah, so for this book, I began with quite a bit of field research. Um, as I said, I interviewed more than 50 scientists for this book. Um, and so I'd go to places like the California Academy of Scientists and talk to the coral researchers there. 
But then, like for many authors, the pandemic hit. So in some cases, especially during the height of the pandemic, I actually did Zoom tours of many of the researchers' labs. And there was one even at um, PARC, so the Powder Mill Avian Research Center in Pennsylvania, where he took me around their campus and their tunnel that they have, um, where they allow birds to fly through this tunnel and to test what kind of windows are more bird safe. And they're essentially doing these like bird safe window experiments. And so he took me there. He was showing me the birds that they use and to bag. And he's literally just walking around with this laptop and like introducing me to everyone there. So it was kind of a mix of in the field and Zoom in the field <laughs> reporting. Was that your most memorable experience doing this, or were there other ones? Um, that one was certainly a memorable one, just for how odd the whole thing felt. Um, another one that I found quite memorable was um, watching ants, surprisingly enough, in the Mojave Desert. Ants sound boring, but they're very mesmerizing to watch. I mean, it's like crazy just to see how this system is fully functional with these tiny little creatures who cannot communicate by means that we typically know of. Um, if you were just to pick up an ant and drop it off in the middle of nowhere, it wouldn't survive. Same with hun uh, 100 ants. But once you put like a million of ants into one nest, they become this super organism and they become this fully functioning system without any one ant in command. And it's pretty incredible to watch and especially to see it in the Mojave Desert where their nests kind of look like if someone poked a hole in, in the dirt, it's like kind of like sandy dirt, and it just kind of looks like you poked a hole in the ground and there's bunches of them all around. And it's just absolutely fascinating to watch them. So I heard you um, did a lot of research and early on you talked about how you had this big document of all these things or spreadsheet. Um, were there any stories that, that you liked, but you didn't quite manage to fit in the book. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, there are definitely ones that I was interested in that I kind of touch on here, too. So like nanostructures, you can use nanostructures to create structural color, but also potentially to create hydrophilic or hydrophobic um, surfaces. So surfaces that are either um, deter water and or make water stream down an object's face, which could be useful for self-cleaning products, um, or hydrophilic so that it attracts water, um, kind of like the Namib beetle in the Saharan desert, um, should you want to collect water maybe like into a bottle or something. Um, yeah, what was the rest of the question again? Oh, <laughs> the no, research, no, no. I guess, no. of like, oh, which ones I found most interesting. So but, but that one was- But you didn't manage to include in the book or something, but yeah. Um, it's, it's mentioned in passing, but it's not an entire chapter. Right. Um, another one is neural networks. So neural networks were originally inspired by the brain, but they kind of took on a life of their own and have veered completely away from their initial source of inspiration. But we're kind of circling back around again and, we're kind of observing how humans go from short-term to long-term memory in the hypothalamus and if that can be used for our large language models and if we compare our large language models with long-term memory. Um, that would have been a very interesting, it's definitely still an ongoing piece of research and I felt like other people could cover that better than I could. And I really wanted to choose topics that I felt like were already out there, they've already been established, and they've had a huge impact on society in one way or another. Right. I'll, I'll pull a question from the Dory and then I'll get an audience question, but are there any um, instances where biology is not efficient and we shouldn't use it for inspiration? Mm, yeah, that's a great question. Um, one of my favorite examples from the book is this thing, this, um, in the giraffe, they have this thing called a laryngeal nerve, and it actually goes from the brain to the larynx. But due to evolution and how they've gotten to be where they are, that laryngeal nerve, it should only be like a few inches apart, right? Because it's the brain and the larynx. It actually goes from their brain all the way down their long neck, loops around the aortic arch in their chest, and then comes all the way back up to their larynx for a total of 15 feet. And 
what I find so interesting is that engineers call this a monument in inefficiency. And they even believe that the dinosaurs had a 70-foot version of this. Um, and you even see it in humans as well, though to a much shorter and less dramatic degree. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, we have an audience question. <clears throat> Hi. Um, first of all, thanks for this great talk. It was very inspiring. I, it's, it's, it's a two-part question. Um, the first part is, um, what inspired you to embark on this journey? Um, and, and I'd really like to know that. And the second part is, um, during the journey, have you had learnings that you were able to apply in your day-to-day -day life or um, you know, things that you were able to pick up on and implement in surroundings around you? Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you. Um, my initial, I really wanted to cover this because I was a science and environment journalist and we would sometimes cover these stories, but sometimes we wouldn't. We had other beats that we had to cover or other articles that I had to write. And so I would just start collecting these because I thought they were such an interesting story and maybe I would create a blog or I would share it in some way or another. And then I just kept starting to hear and see these stories from researchers doing incredible work, like at MIT with robotics and chemists at OSU. And it was really this cross interdisciplinary approach to science that I found so fascinating. And I do environmental research to begin with. And I loved that this takeaway about preserving diversity that we're learning from nature itself but it's also a call to basic research. So some of these things are like, why should you study a lobster eye? It doesn't have any immediate benefit for humans. It's really just research for the sake of research, at least when you first think about it. And yet, you can have some of these massive takeaways that can be really beneficial and can have consequence for us down the line. And I think, basic research funding, at least when I was talking to the scientists, is becoming less and less, um, is becoming less and less funded. And usually these days, if you want to get grants, you have to make a case for why it can help or apply to humans. And many of the researchers were kind of discouraged by that and um, felt a need to kind of share that with me. And then to the second point of your question, I think something that I took away from biomimicry itself is how animals really adapt to their local environment. And this is still kind of a question that I grapple with, but I really do see the power of learning about the strengths and the difficulties of your local environment and how best to harness that specific space to um, create things like solar or you know, wherever you happen to be, really trying to harness that specific local environment to become the best you can in that specific region. We do have a lot of globalization these days, and there could be a case for that as well, but I think this idea of also trying to return to having local specialization, especially in concerns to our energy and climate change and that kind of thing, um, can be really powerful. I have, I have a short question, and yeah. <laughs> it came up during your presentation some, so. I hope, hope it's okay, but uh, you call them lobster eye telescopes. Is that like, do they refer to them that way when they're up in space? And we're like, we launched this lobster eye telescope? Or? Yes, and I love this about NASA. It's uh -huh. just so straight to the point. I mean, we know NASA has great public relations, but um, they do. They call them the lobster eye telescopes. That was super easy to find in papers. For all of these things, I made sure that there was primary papers and that I talked to the scientists who were directly involved in the research or if, unfortunately, they passed away to their colleagues. Um, and they do. They call them lobster eye telescopes. I would have put the more official name up there, but they just went straight to the point. You know. <laughs> I love that. I find that kind of neat. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm distracted by lobster eye telescopes still. Um, so, so how do you think, um, you have lots of stories about people being inspired by nature. How do you think each of us can be inspired by nature to have wild ideas? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think part of it also just comes from breaking out of your own research field and talking to other people in different fields if you're in research. Um, for some people, the takeaway may just be to see the beauty of the butterfly colors they see in their own backyard and to understand that structural color can be a possibility instead of these industrial toxic dyes in some instances. Not in all instances, but in some instances. And 
to even pay attention to the work that places like Harvard and Georgia Tech are doing and to really support that kind of research. Um, I think that can be a big takeaway, but personally, I just love the interdisciplinary nature of it, just to really talk to a wide range of people and to get ideas from lots of different fields and see if there's anything that you can take away from that um, to your own benefit, or at least to inspire an idea. They don't always have to be one-to-one. And there's one story you had in particular that, that I kind of appreciate, because a lot of these stories are people being inspired by nature, they see these things, they like them, but there's one story, I think, where somebody was annoyed by nature after a hunting trip, and okay. it inspired them on a, um, for an invention. What, can you tell us more about that? Oh yeah, I think you're referring to the one, um, it was the Swiss electrical engineer, George de Mestrel, and he was out on a hunting trip, with his dog, and he was getting really annoyed by all these burrs that were collecting on his pants and on his dog's fur. And so he actually went back to his house and he had a microscope and he looked at like what was going on with these pesky burrs that just like kept annoying him on his hunting trips. And he found that these burrs use this hook and loop system to attach themselves so well to us. And I mean, it took him years and many failures and many no's before he eventually invented what we know of as Velcro. And we now use Velcro in hospitals and on the International Space Station, and it's incredibly ubiquitous. But at the time, people just thought it was strange. Like, you had buttons, you know, like, what is Velcro? Like, why would you need that? I, I really like that we have Velcro, and I really like that it came from somebody <laughs> just being annoyed by, like, all these things sticking to it. Yeah. Um, there's there's somebody just saying hi, but I'm going to skip that one. But hi, <laughs> hi from Susan. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> how how is the mundane nature the the answer soils in our backyard seen as a realm of discovery versus the more extraordinary instances of nature like smokers at the bottom of the ocean or far flung flora, a fauna or flora. Wow, tongue twister. Um, yeah. Yeah, you can read it too. Smokers at the bottom of the ocean or far-flung fauna or flora. Yeah, you're getting to see that better than I did. <laughs> um, well, I think at least how I'm understanding this mm. question is that you can really find inspiration wherever. I mean, part of this was the beginning of this presentation was about how you can look at these creatures and plants with new eyes. So seeing where they do, they're incredibly sticky. Well, we kind of think we know about sticky. Well, they may not do sticky the same way. A lot of these creatures have gone about it from a different approach or different angles, especially if they live in different environments. So they may use a completely different chemical that we can use. It's not that the approach to stickiness is just one approach. They often go about it in many different ways. Same with eyes, right? So you have pit eyes and pinhole eyes and compound eyes, lensed eyes, all of this kind of stuff. It's really this diversity of approaches that I find so amazing. And um, yeah, and you can see it in even the most mundane or even some of the most extraordinary instance, instances. You really just have to, yeah, take a look. I'll go for another question from Dory. How might biomimicry inform our approach to technology? For example, in nature, waste equals food. There is no waste since every kind of waste from one organism is food for another organism. So how yeah. can we do that better in technology where maybe we don't have as much waste? Well, I think researchers are working on this if they're referring to like a food packaging. I know that there are people who are trying to make packaging be more like fruit peels and stuff like this. How I kind of take this question in terms of technology is nanomaterials and nanostructures. So we're trying to actually go smaller and smaller, kind of like in technology as well, right? You start big and then you go smaller and smaller. We're also doing this in the field of biomimicry and they're going into these nanostructures and more flexible materials for um, things like our robotics sensors, medicine, et cetera. Um, that in itself should minimize waste. Um, in terms of having a more cyclical economy kind of like nature has, I think that would, of course, be the ultimate goal. Um, just that in itself, that idea would be biomimicry as an inspiration. I don't think we're quite there yet, but I do think that if we harness this idea of trying to be more local, that we can reach something closer to that. 
I'll go for another question from Dory. Um, as you explored and did this research, did you encounter the reverse direction where organisms that seemingly took inspiration from humans? Other organisms that seemingly took inspiration from us humans. Nature being inspired by humans. Wow, I mean, that could be humans. a really interesting book. If somebody, if that person has <laughs> <laughs> examples in mind, I would love to talk to them and they should really write that book because I have no idea. Um, but I would love to hear what they have to say about organisms taking inspiration from us. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't have an answer for that one in particular. Um, what are your thoughts about GMOs and the danger of unintended biological innovations getting out into the wild? Um, I think that's a really interesting question. I think that we, all, we always have to be thoughtful about the kind of innovations that we do. I think there's also benefits to genetically modified organisms and um, some of these things are just unforeseen consequences and then we also do have to adapt and change and then try to resolve quickly. But being thoughtful, about making things. I, part of what I think is really important is that you don't just make things for the sake of making things, right? But why are we making something? What is the life of that product? So once it comes into fruition, once we have it on the shelves, what does that life look like? How are we going to discard that product? It kind of feels like when we do inventions, all we ever think about is the process to create that invention. But we don't then think about, well, what is the life of that invention going to be and how are we going to discard that invention? And I would love for us to take that extra step and kind of going back to that person's waste question, maybe there's a way that we can create more recyclable products out there or we can really innovate on those last two steps rather than just creating for the sake of creating. And you, you may have covered this in some of your other answers, but, but where do you see the future of biomimicry going? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I do think that it goes back to the nanostructures. Um, it's just going to be incredibly useful, I think, for not only the fun things like plasmonic color displays, so creating color, but for the hydrophobic and hydrophilic surfaces, um, for medicine and technology, sensors. Um, when I was at least talking to some of the researchers from MIT, um, they seemed to be the most excited about this field of where biomimicry is going. Also because out in, out in nature, you don't really see a lot of things like steel and concrete and these like really hard materials. But the ability to create a soft, flexible material is not that easy. But we are actually getting, starting to get much better at it. And I think especially for you know, robotics and stuff, this is going to be incredibly useful and it's gonna be really exciting to watch too. Well, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. <laughs>